Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Um, I guess I'll also introduce myself. So my name is Mara Graziani. I'm a postdoc researcher at uh, IBM Research Europe and at Ashwas Sobalet, that is a University of Applied Sciences in the western part of Switzerland. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here and actually this is a great opportunity for me to present a, a journal paper that, uh, that we published, uh, I think at the beginning of this year. Uh, that is entitled The Global Taxonomy of Interpretable AI, Unifying the Terminology for the Technical and the Social Sciences. And I mean, um, let me just give a bit of a, a story about this paper, because I'm actually working for a European project, like I'm funded by a European project, it's called AI for Media. And the, the, the purpose of AI for Media is to build a network of excellence, um, so joining partners a bit for, from everywhere in Europe, um, to, to bring excellence in AI and to see how AI can actually be used to help the society and the media industry. And this, this infrastructure with, with people is actually made by different, very different types of expertise. Like uh, we have a lot of lawyers and philosophers and ethicists uh, in the same um, network. And one of the things that happened when we were talking about uh, the challenges in AI and interpretability is that we realized that we were never using the same words and we were not really understanding each other. So if you can see here uh, in the acknowledgements, here there is a bunch of people that actually belong to AI for Media. And there's also a bunch of people that are not within the AI for Media consortium, but were actually uh, invited and they accepted to participate in this initiative. Um, because we realized that we needed first to set down a taxonomy that was global, so that was actually understood by, by everyone, both technicians, so people, I would explain like me, that have been working more on computer science and uh, machine learning and deep learning, uh, but also other type of people that have a very different type of knowledge that is that of the social sciences. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, uh, we had, uh, we had a workshop online, um, that, uh, lasted kind of, uh, three or six hours. They don't even remember where everyone actually presented their own, uh, their own point of view on interpretability. And then we continued this initiative and we started writing up a paper and, and that's the result of it. So I think I'm very excited today to present this paper because it has a lot of content and I think um it's great to be able to to present it and to explain it to everyone the, the way i lived it and the way i understood it okay so um i mean i won't go over the motivation because i think if you guys are all here you already agree with me that uh, interpretability is uh, important i just wanted to point out that what, we're talking about ai here and ai can be used and exists in a plethora of different forms already. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's not a case here that I'm putting some of the most known companies that are already implementing AI uh, and they're already using AI in the in the software that they that they provide us and in the services that they provide us with. And uh, I mean, if you think about also other applications like autonomous driving and um, uh, I mean, I put here a photo of when I was in Seoul and it was great because there was this robot that was going around uh, the airport and was asking passengers, how can they help? And, and I mean, all of these are examples of the fact that the AI simply started growing and growing and is now permeating our lives, which is awesome. Um, but at the same time, I mean, this, apart, if you remove, if you remove the case of, um, of autonomous driving, most of these companies are providing services that are very low risk. I mean, uh, Netflix is providing um, a kind of service for suggesting uh, movies or music like Spotify, Siri and Google. I mean, all of these are services that uh, if they give you the wrong answer, nothing bad really happens. Worst case, you waste two hours watching a bad movie. That's, that's not really the end of the world, right? Um, but while these things were happening, uh, there were other initiatives and I mean, um, I've been mostly based in Europe, but uh, I know that there's the, a DARPA initiative for explainable AI and the need to really clarifying and setting down the basis and a strong basis, uh, giving a lot of uh, substantial funding um, in the research towards explainable AI. And similarly in Europe now, there is the, with the general data protection law and also the AI Act, um, the, the intent is that of uh, containing and regulating the use of AI in everyday life, um, particularly 
to um, prevent bad things from happening and to ensure uh, the security of the society when the tools are actually uh, already being used uh, most of the time during our daily lives. So what the AIF is proposing right now, this, um, this risk-based policy uh, for trust in AI, is actually to ban all the applications that are creating a risk that is not acceptable, so that are exposing people at an unacceptable level of risk. And not only this, but at the same time, like um, they are introducing particular requirements for the high-risk applications. So if before we were talking about uh, user filtering, uh, user content filtering, but we can think of, uh, and some of you actually know because you introduced yourself and you're working in the medical domain or in chemistry. If you think about using AI for uh, synthesizing new drugs or um, giving a diagnosis to a patient, you see this is a very high risk application and there are serious consequences that might be involved with that. And there are strict regulations, uh, at least in Europe, um, for actually uh, obtaining um, approval and um, uh, setting the standards for products to actually enter um, the, the deployment state and uh, introduce AI in, there, in the products that are actually on the market. And I mean, this can also be seen if you start counting the number of publications per year on interpretable AI. You see that there is, uh, there is, there, is, there was a uh, little interest back in twenty ten, but actually this interest has been growing uh, impressively and massively uh, in, the, in the past decade. So uh, more and more papers have been uh, written, and more and more works have been proposed in the field. Uh, with a big boom, I think that was uh, around 2016, 2017. and uh, I will just briefly state one thing about the motivation for, for interpretability in particular, and also trustworthiness and all of these initiatives, so all of these initiatives behind trust in AI. And the one thing that I want to mention is that we know that uh, AI can bring uh, exceptional results. We've seen this, and by measuring performance, by evaluating the performance on external and validation test sets, we can really see these exceptional results, and we can even see sometimes these models uh, exceeding human performance. So, if you think about um, think about a task that, as a human with a naked eye, for example, you wouldn't be able to do. Think about uh, looking at the retina. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a photo of a retina. Um, but um, I mean, I've worked with those kind of data and essentially you can see really a lot of detail in the, of the retina, but um, an ophthalmologist used this data to actually identify different types of, di of diseases and problematic that might happen. But there are AI tools that can predict from that, those pictures, they can predict uh, blood pressure and risk of card cardiovascular disease and smoking habits and patterns. And these are things that uh, a trained ophthalmologist, no matter for how many years he's been working in the, in the field, he wouldn't be able to do with that level of precision and with that level of accuracy. So this is what I mean when uh, you have AI models that are exceeding human performance and that are doing something uh, better than humans. To make another more, probably more, more popular and more mainstream example, think of uh, the Alpha Zero or Alpha Go algorithms being the, the world masters, right? Um, so the problem with this, I mean, all of this is amazing, but there is a problem. And the problem is that these models are trained on data sets that were collected with a certain bias already. Because if you think about how the world is structured and um, what is the what are the problematics that um, different um, populations, different cultures are facing in different places of the world? You will see that there are very advanced countries where data collection is very easy, whereas there are other countries that have different type of problems and where data collection is uh, not as massive and extensive. So it is normal to think that data collections present inequalities um, and actually they do show inequalities and uh, if you think of race and gender that's one of the most uh, common examples in the field so, um, if you read about fairness um, all of the problems deriving from shifts towards uh, underrepresented categories um, the reason behind that is simply because of how the data collection has been has been going on in the past years 
And the problems with this is that when you think of the consequences that this can have um, in high risk applications, so in, in high stakes, this can be very dramatic. So think again about uh, um, creating and synthesizing a, a, a new drug or a new vaccine for a particular disease and not taking into account gender imbalance or a particular subpopulation that is underrepresented in your data set. I'm not saying this as, as an hypothetical case, it actually happened that uh, some CAR T cells, so that some, some kind of immune uh, immunotreatment for, for cancer was, was tested in a clinical trial and something bad went on and the two patients had a very strong um, immune reaction that killed them. So when you arrive to this point, if you think about introducing anything that was designed by an AI system and introducing it and uh, using it to create something that then is um, used on patients or on people, this can have very dramatic consequences and there can be very dramatic problems if um, these mistakes happen and we don't know how to deal with them. Uh, think about rejecting a CV, um, think about uh, automated driving and the fatal crashes that have been um, in, in, the case, in, in the cases of automated driving, that, like cars that were seeing unexpected and unforeseen events uh, reacting in very weird ways. And or think also of the stock market, what might happen if your yeah, algorithm, uh, a very popular yeah, algorithm that everyone is using starts predicting that the stock market is failing. Well, this actually is, this is a real photo. This actually happened, right? There was an AI behind, but still something like that can happen. And we need to be prepared for that. So um, this is what I wanted essentially to say about the motivation. And um, here is really a photo, a picture, and a diagram of, uh, encapsulating what I what I what, what I think when I say that we should first see how the data were collected and those data how like influenced the model that was trained and the idea here is really to put the domain experts in the center so have a human centric approach to both data collection and model training and to do so we see that there is uh, a need not only for performance metrics so they conventional like accuracy and performance metrics that you can use to evaluate the performance of a model, but also additional toolboxes. And one of these is interpretability. Obviously, it's not the only one. Um, and the idea is really to have this feedback loop where the domain experts that might not understand the performance metrics right away might actually be exposed to uh, the model performance to interpretability and then give feedback on how to actually improve the data collection and the model training processes. What's the problem in this is that when you look at the domain experts, I mean, you might have the user, you might have a lawyer, you might have a philosopher, a developer, and they all speak different languages. And it is very difficult for them to interact because if they are not using the same language, they will be referring to different concepts or maybe to the same concept with different words. And I think here is where really the friction is right now. And the problem is also that in software design, very often you don't introduce philosophers right from the start or you might not introduce lawyers right from the start so what i'm saying here is maybe revolutionary a bit but i think uh the more we try to reduce this friction and the more we interact with other type of experts the better the models will be because these models are designed for the society and for the use in the society so this was a bit of an introduction and giving the motivation and the context but going to the paper, uh, I think there are some clear contributions of the paper that I think you can use as takeaways. And I hope that after this presentation, you will not have to read the paper. <laughs> but we will have a look at the etymological analysis of the words and the words that uh, go around uh, interpretability. We will also look at the world inflection. So what I, what I was saying before, when you have domain experts that use a certain type of vocabulary, uh, depending on which domain they're in, we will look at how these inflections actually change from the technical to the social uh, sciences. And we will also analyze the global definition of interpretability, which is something that we proposed uh, in this paper and that I think is not set in stone. So it's it's always ready to be challenged. It's always there to be to be rewritten and to be modified. But I think it's good to have at least something down and um, and some discussion going on that is being documented through papers. 
and then we will have a look at the at the technical taxonomy. So it's essentially how we divide the, the method the methodologies. But I think there are many papers that do this. So I don't think this is one of the main contributions of the paper, whereas the other three are quite strong. And finally, I think one of the most useful points in this paper was really interaction with philosophers and ethicists and lawyers. And these perspectives were actually very new for people in the technical sciences. So I think these perspectives on the problems might be actually very insightful and might drive the design of new techniques or new AI models. Okay, so going on to the, to the etymology, so this is one of the main contributions of the paper, and I put the, the table here, but we won't have to read it all. I think what we can see is a focus on a few words and where they come from. And I mean, if you look at interpretability, it comes back from the Latin, and it's Latin and late times. So I think at the beginning, probably, I don't know, maybe there were not examples. Um, but the idea here is really to use interpretability, and it is meant to interpret. And I think it refers to the fact that back then, um, one thing they had, the Romans had was this arts oratoria, so where you could go and um, give a speech in front of a lot of people. And most of the times, it is also about interpreting the speech and presenting the speech. So it's, it's about how we expose, uh, how people exposed uh, information. And you can look at transparency. Transparency comes even later, like medieval Latin came much later than Latin. And here the idea is really to um, to show to show uh, to show through. So it's really imagine of something transparent, right? Something that you can see stuff coming through from it. So to see through. And if you look at reliability, which is another word that is also also very often used next to interpretability and explainability, we see that it has completely another etymology. It comes from Scottish. It's like a Scottish word actually. Um, and the Scottish word comes from Old French, and Old French obviously comes also from Latin, but this is all another period. And, and here the idea is really to bind. And I think uh, the, the idea of, of binding here is really about in the sense of to rely on something, to be able to consistently, consistently use something and because we trust something and we can use it all the time. Um, so, we will look at these words in detail later, but we can also look at the different words that are in the etymology and how they actually use in different domains. And when I was mentioning the, the so social sciences and the technical sciences, I think it's also good to like really put this put the, down the names. And so on one side, you see technology, the technology sciences, I think it's where all of us work. So it's um, AI, machine learning, deep learning. Um, but there are also a, a lot of other type of people that are involved and that are regulating AI. I think about the lawyers that are writing the regulations, the European regulations. Think about philosophers and sociologists. So sociologists, most of the time, look also at the situation of the society itself and how it works. And AI is having an impact on the, on the world we're living in. So you need to put them in the picture. And philosophers mostly really their contribution is if you think about submitting a project proposal or getting something funded if you want to have your own startup and you are working with people data well there is some kind of ethics behind using whatever you collect from people right whatever type of data you collect and particularly in the medical case if you're using patient data there is a lot of um, ethical regulations that uh, go behind that are running on behind it and that's why you need philosophers and ethicists. And um, at the same time, I mean, we're talking about interpretability here. Interpretability is something that happens, uh, as I was saying, is the act of interpreting, is the act of exposing information. But we do expose information to someone, and we hope that this person is going to receive the information and is going to interpret it and understand it at some point. And so if you think about understanding and processing information in our brain, there is all the area of the cognitive sciences and how we actually process information in our brains that needs to be considered when you're talking about interpretability. Because to be honest, the way I process information may be very different to the way another person processes information. And this is what the cognitive sciences are studying. So you need to put them in the picture. And finally, I think it was very nice because we had the occasion to work with a sociologist in the work work context and everything that goes around labor and the workplace 
And she also had very interesting insights about actually how interpretability and mostly AI, uh, of course, AI is the big driver here for change, but um, I think interpretability is how also it interacts. AI can interact and can be understood by humans. So in a sense, if there is AI driving the change, interpretability is going to be a bit uh, the key to, to understand what, uh, what these models are doing. And there, there is a possibility that this might also change the workplace in the sense that it might not replace, um, AI may not replace humans in and not um, replace their position. So like work, workforce uh, is always going to be needed. Um, but what might change is actually the task that the people are, are going to have to solve or to do during their daily jobs. And when you think about this, um, AI is really meant to be an instrument that people can use in the workplace to make their life easier. I mean, think about deep GPT now. It's a big uh, topic of discussion, right? Uh, think you could ask DGP to write something for you instead of writing it from scratch. And if you, if we have a reliable system, a trustworthy system, and an accountable system for mistakes, this might also, also change a lot the workplace and the rights of the workplace. And um, so we had this discussion also with these people. And the discussion was evolving around these different worlds. And I mean, I think this is something nice to look at the paper and to give it time because I think uh, it's very difficult to present it right now in a slide, but um, it needs time to be seen and to be digested. But we can take one word, for example, and see really how it changes. And if you look at explainable, one of the things, for example, it's written in the in the general in the law in the European law for the general data protection. You see that here they're saying that explainability means the um, providing meaningful information about the underlying logic, the significance, and also the consequences of using an algorithm for automated processing of the patient data, or sorry, for of the, uh, people data. But if you look at how we interpreted explainability in the technology, in the technology, so when we are developing models for explainability, what we think of is mostly like providing justifications for the model predictions. We don't think about what could be the consequences of the model predictions. Like this is, I've never seen it in um, any technical work of explainability to include the, the consequences of giving a wrong prediction. Yes, of course, we, we know that the wrong prediction might lead to wrong decisions, but it all depends on how the information is presented. And I don't think we, we really have the same definition here going on for the two. And similarly, for transparency, uh, if you look at transparency, the way it is interpreted in, in the, the, the regulations, they, they, so, they see it as transparency of the data and of the business model. So transparency of, of the people, of the, of the companies that are providing the, the service. Whereas for us, transparency is actually the transparency of the model. So trying to um, understand the mechanism and uh, enable simulability and the composability and, and a lot of other, other things. So I think, I mean, I see that there is something in the chat. I don't know if it's a question. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, all of this, all of this is uh, different word inflections that are analyzed in the paper. And I think um, they need a bit of time for to be digested and to be seen. Uh, but we're gonna look at some of the words in the specific. So we'll start from interpretability. And I think it is, this is the moment now to give the, um, the definition, the global definition that we're proposing in the paper. And I think, so an AI system, we define it as interpretable if it's possible to translate the working principles and the outcomes of these AI systems in a human understandable language. And I think this was already said in other works, but the most important part here is I think um, that whatever type of um, translation we give should not affect the validity of the system. And by this, what I mean is that if you think of, of this curve here as, a, as your decision function of a complex deep learning model, whatever, you could think of, um, I mean, of what most explainability, like postdoc explainability methods do, and generally what they do is they find an approximation of the decision function. So they, you can see this as a, 
as a series of tangents, so a decomposition essentially of this function. And this could be an explanation because this is a, what is called an inher inherently interpretable model, right? But the problem here is that this is not the real model. There is this part yet that is not well modeled. There is this part yet that is not well modeled. And this is only an approximation. So if we were able to interpret this model, like the original black curve, um, without changing it, then we would have perfect interpretability. But what exists actually right now, a lot of the methods that exist right now are only giving uh, relaxed and only um, fulfilling an, appro an approximation and a, relax a relaxation of this definition that is the um, fact of using an approximation of the system. And of course, I mean, this is needed because otherwise with our definition, we would lose a lot of uh, uh, methods that already exist. And those methods are very useful. I'm not saying that they're not useful. What I'm saying is that what would be optimal is to actually get a translation in human understanding of the language without affecting the validity of the system at all. And there are there are a lot of works that are already going in this direction. And I didn't put them here because I think this is out of the scope of the paper, but I'm really happy to discuss them afterwards. Now, as I was saying before, we need to consider the cognitive sciences as well. And I, in the definition of the theory as well, uh, there was this concept of human understandable, but what, what is human understandable? What does it even mean? And for this, we really need to see how information processing works in our brain. And if I were to give you an example here, if you had to recognize what this image is, well, you would probably say, and I think you all agree that this is a bird. And the way this information might be processed from the brain, if give, to give you an example, might be just the recognition of some basic patterns. So for example, uh, the feathers and the wings. So recognizing shape, recognizing color, but also recognizing action. So understanding that this thing is in motion, that this thing is flying, this is understanding an action. And all of this, all of these characteristics are mapped to a specific area of our brain. Um, and this was uh, a model essentially um, of the, what is called the semantic memory. So we have, we have an area in our brain that is uh, meant to incorporate and to memorize everything that we've seen while, and, and from, from learn like from growing until every day, right? We can keep memorizing things to to understand them and to actually collect this um, semantic information. And it's structured in different ways. So you can have some areas that react to actions, some areas that react to words, some areas to sounds, shapes, color, and also to identifying motion. And essentially, the fact of understanding something is really this ability of our brain to go back and identify areas and uh, connect the points with the semantic memory. And so inferring and making predictions within this space of the semantic memory. And I mean, I think at this point it becomes much clearer that there is uh, quite a degree of uh, subjectivity within understanding things because uh, the way I memorize things in my semantic memory, it's unique to my experience and to what I was exposed to when I was growing. And this is different for each of us. So uh, it is strongly influenced by personal background and prior experiences. Okay, having said this, um, we can move now to what is explainability. And I think um, there is a lot of debate about Equating interpretability with explainability. Many people use it interchangeably, fine. Um, many people actually assign it, assign it a different meaning to the two of them. And the point here is it is fine in, within the, the, the world of our technical development. Uh, we can do as much as you want, uh, as long as we are coherent within like the same work, right? The problem is when we are interfacing other type of people that have that cannot understand what we're working on because they don't have the same background as ours. Take a lawyer or take a philosopher. They might be able, they might be uh, very familiar with what we're working on, but there are less chances, honestly, that they will really know in depth this domain. And so we are the expert in this domain and they are the expert in their domain. And it is very difficult for them to understand if we keep interchanging the words and uh, not being clear about which of the two, like whether they mean the same thing or whether they don't. So going back to the etymology, that's the reason, actually, that's the reason why, because since many, like in many papers and many authors, 
interchange interpretability and explainability, and they say that it's exactly the same thing. And there are many other papers that claim that there is a difference. So it's like opinion versus opinion. It's very difficult to understand who's right. So we went back to the etymology, and that's why we went back to time, because we wanted to have a look and to understand. And I mean, obviously, also explainability comes from the Latin, and it is very connected. There is a strong link between interpreting and explaining. So. Um, in the, in the sense that interpretability, as I was saying, is mostly seen as exposing, illustrating, interpreting information, whereas explainability is clarifying information, but clarifying information also includes exposing information, stating clearly information. So there is a strong link between the two, and this is very clear. And that is why I think it is also okay to say that uh, interpretability and explainability can be equated. But there is actually a much larger number of papers that is claiming that there is a difference between the two. And I think one of the probably most impactful papers in the, in the literature is the one of Cynthia Rudin. It's a perspective paper. So she had this position paper saying, stop explaining black box machine learning models and use interpretable models instead. And here, like she's clearly using two different words to refer to two different types of models. And I mean, with this position paper, the position paper, the, the scope of the position paper here was not about the words and the wording, but it was um, rather about what type of models we should be developing. And I think this, this point of view is probably the most promising also to differentiate the two, the two words, because we can see as interpretability as the set of interpretable models. So all of those models for which you can actually inter interpret, explain, expose, illustrate, and comment on the outcome generation process. Whereas explainability is a smaller set of techniques and it is essentially the act of generating explanations. And we can discuss on that. And I, as I said, this is not set in stone, but what I think is really that if you see the way it is put in this paper, you can think of interpretable models as a larger pool. And if you think about the definition of interpretability, interpretable models in theory, they are um, as the, the explanation that you give. So the, the exposition that you give, the, the illustration that you give about the output generation process doesn't affect the validity of the system, which means that interpretability is already a component in the system itself. Whereas when you think of explainability, you could think of a postdoc uh, approach. So an approach that doesn't need the uh, retraining of the model parameters. Um, so you could take whatever model you have already trained on your data and generate a postdoc analysis after training without changing the model itself. That might give you some kind of explanation, but most of these postdoc methods actually uh, solve only the relaxation of our definition of interpretability that is um, considering an approximation of the real model. And I mean, I think this, this was a really strong, strong statement and I, I agree with it. Um, I think it, if we could have interpretability and high performance at the same time, well, we should go for it. Uh, I don't see why we shouldn't. So I think obviously it is not possible in all applications. And this is why we need explainability as well. Um, but if we could go for interpretability, we should. So. I hope this was clear, but I can answer questions at any moment if it's not. And another word that was often used is transparency. And maybe you guys don't think that transparency and interpretability are um, often um, equated, but outside of our domain of expertise, they are very often uh, used interchangeably. And I think this is something that we, this is a message that should should pass. Um, and mostly, we should be very careful when we talk about transparency because I think that transparency does not imply interpretability. I mean, we could the, the fact of seeing through the model, the fact of um, giving this uh, unbiased insights about the internal model mechanics might not necessarily mean that we can interpret what's going on. So this is uh, this was just a word that I wanted to mention about the the meaning of transparency. And so all of these all of these words to summarize it, I mean, in the paper, there are there are more, I think it would be just extremely boring to go from one to the other. So 
I took the three most important, but you can see here that there is um, that there is a bit of a structure right now. If you look at independent words, the individual words and how they actually relate to each other and interact with each other, you can actually have a structural view of a larger uh, domain that is that of uh, safe AI and safety in AI. And of course, this involves also other things that are not necessarily related to interoperability, for example, the privacy preserving aspect of safe AI, but most of it actually goes uh, at the bottom into looking into transparency, interoperability and causality. And here, I think I wanted to put a, a diagram of all the dif different type of people that might be helpful in each of these in each of these domains. So when you look at causality, obviously it's mostly us developers, but if you look at interoperability, it needs to be a discussion between the developers and the end users, of course, because without the end users, you cannot really know. I mean, this goes back to what I was saying about understanding things. As developers, we have a semantic memory and uh, we process information in a way that is very different from how the end user of the AI model can actually process information. So there needs to be the discussion between developers and end users to actually understand what can they understand at all. And okay, so I think then the, one of the other things that we see we saw deriving from from this definition of interoperability is obviously a technical taxonomy of the methods. And I said I will not go over this extensively because I think there is a lot of papers that are much more focused on that and are much better than ours. And I can give you references, but um, I think essentially there are three or four points maybe that we are introducing about the technical taxonomy that are very important. And one of them is that you can think of um, AI interoperability models as a lossy compression of your training data set, right? So you, you have your training data set and you're generating this compression and obviously you're losing something from it, but that's an AI model. And then if you think of this, and if you accept this definition, then you can think of interoperability as a lossy compression of the model outcomes. And so you see that here we're compressing and compressing and we are losing some specific specificity simply by compressing. And I think this is a nice perspective on the fact that um, justifies why there are actually multiple interpretability outcomes for the same model that can be equally valid. And, and this is not only for, for deep learning models or machine learning models. Like if you think about how humans work, if you ask for an explanation, to someone, there might be two valid explanations for the same for the same phenomenon, right? For the same thing. So, I think in the same way, there might be multiple uh, explainability outcomes that are equally valid, even if they are very different. The only thing is that uh, they should try. They should probably be complementary, or they should agree at least at some at some point, uh, and not be completely misleading. So this is uh, the, obviously the evaluation of the interoperability outcomes is strongly affected by, by this. And I think the way we evaluate interoperability outcomes is still lacking a lot of research and needs uh, much more development than it is right now. But there are some initiatives that are coming up. You can check the, I think it's called the explainability benchmark. Um, you can check, uh, there is Quantus, I think it's another toolbox that emerged for evaluating interoperability outcomes. So there is some work that is being done, but I think the, the fact that multiple explanations can be equally valid uh, strongly affects how we evaluate. And that's also one main reason why we need humans in the loop, because in the end, if we consider the end users, we can try to measure, um, we can try to measure that uh, the level of understandability and satisfaction from the users. Now, I'm not an expert in, in, uh, in regulations and, uh, and law, but I wanted to give the perspective that emerged from working with, with the lawyers, because I think it can be really useful, um, both for driving next, the future development and also for understanding what are the needs. And in the European regulations, the, there is actually another word <laughs> that is explicability. And when I heard of it, I couldn't believe it because um, I've never seen it in any of our technical work. So I was like, how can they talk about something that we're not even doing? Oh. So explicability is a sort of mixture of explainability and transparency. 
So you're trying to obtain both uh, the possibility of obviously giving explanations for the for the outcomes, um, but also you want transparency. So you want your model to, you want to have an unbiased picture of your model. So it, it actually fits very well the, the taxonomy that we that we derived because if you think about it, um, it, it for them explicability means having these meaningful insights. Um, and they can be collected both ex tante, so before actually uh, using the model, there should be this uh, um, insights about the model and what the model is doing, and also ex post. So after using the model, you should have what is called generally explainability or interpretability of the model outcomes, depending on your model. There is also the fact, as I was mentioning before, and this is also considered um, in the regulations that explicability should target the individuals. So this, um, this property that they're asking and that they're requiring of the models should be personalized and adapted to the, to the individual. And mostly they're focusing on, I think, th three or four features. So uh, they, they think they, they're, they're saying that the model being compliant to the regulations should provide the main features that are used for the output, but also all the features that are used for the output. So if you have a model that is trained on 200 features, but you know that it's not using only four features, that, that can happen. I mean, uh, just do a, uh, I don't know, a shot of uh, your XG boost or whatever you're using, you will see that most of the times there are some driving features, but also you need to provide all the features. So you need to have a clear explanations of all the features that are in your model. And you need to know, you need this kind of post-doc analysis to understand actually which ones are the most relevant. And also you need to be able to explain actual, the, actually the interaction between the features and how they are combined together to get the output. And here, I think it's where they're asking for transparency. Because if you think of uh, transparency as it was defined by Lipton uh, back in uh, 2017 or 2016 in this myth of interpretability paper, he was defining transparency with um, with multiple as a series of multiple properties, and one of those was the um, decomposability of the algorithm. So being able to actually write down the algorithm either as a series of if then rules or as a in uh, mathematical um, language or um, I mean anything anything like that, right? So if you think about for a deep learning model, we can just write down. All the maths behind that and, and that would be an explanation for the interaction between the features uh, and how the output is obtained and then they also they, they also require an understandable representation of the whole model so this i think is maybe the well, this is maybe the most ambitious one and the, the most unclear because it, it is very difficult to understand what is an understandable representation of the entire model we cannot really explain entire models right now we can explain uh to, to, a, to a wide degree how the model behaves on classes or on pools of data but we don't even know how to identify bias for example that is unwanted there is some work but it's very difficult to identify all sources of bias that your model can can have so uh, i think this is this is uh, one of the points that maybe need uh, more clarity right now um and if you think about it, it's true, you could provide a model and all of these requirements and uh, be as exhaustive as you can in describing your models, but there will always be this, what is called um, by the lawyers, a transparency fallacy, meaning that um, the wrong outcomes, the wrong predictions simply shouldn't occur. So in some cases, the autonomous driving car should just not crash. Right? You just wouldn't want these things to happen. So um some of some of the people in the domain have been thinking that uh, explainability the need for explainability was actually overlooked and that it is not needed to provide these explainability insights because what is actually needed is focusing on not having wrong outcomes and i think if you if you uh if you think about that um in some cases, I mean, of course, we can work on robustness and we need to work on robustness of the model. So we need to make sure that the models are robust as much as possible to out distribution and unseen data points and unexpected events. But at the same time, be exhaustive 
uh, testing of all possible combinations is impossible. So we cannot really test for all possible things that can happen, for all possible inputs that our models might see, because there will always be that edge case that we didn't consider. So I think that's where we really need uh, explainability for and also interpretable model. So um, even more than just postdoc uh, explainability. Of course, um, there are ethical hey Mara, challenges. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I just want to interrupt real quick. So we're coming up to the time um, that we've set aside. So if you wouldn't mind, could you maybe briefly give some key points for yes. um, the rest of the presentation you have, and then we can move to some more yes. discussion. I mean, this was uh, this was the last slide, really. Okay, um, great, but thanks. I can I can <laughs> I mean uh, yeah um, yeah just for the for the ethical challenges, I think the very important point um, is that. Um, giving information in a uniform understandable ways in some cases it uh, authorizes omission and this is a very ethical problem because what is allowed to omit and what shouldn't be omitted it's a uh, it's source of uh, a huge discussion so i think um yeah this is one of the main points concerning the ethics and so as you were asking for the remarks i think we need to be aware of the fact that there are discordant definitions in the literature related to AI safety. So whenever you read the literature, you should make sure that you refer to a taxonomy paper. And you also should make sure that you actually understand clearly what the authors mean by using those words. And I think that for future work, what we really need and is key is the collaboration with uh, social scientists as well, and not only technical scientists. When we're talking about interpretability, I'm uh, really, I think it's really important to push forward this idea that uh, the interpretability should not affect the validity of the system. So we should try to have uh, to be as close as possible to the system. So it's possible opting for uh, attention mechanisms or something like that so that we can still uh, have the same performance and we don't have to introduce any other um, element in our loss function. So we're not penalizing performance, but we're still achieving uh, some kind of interpretability. And obviously, um, that interactivity and human-centric approaches should be further explored and not going to be the future. And this, I think uh, we will see what happens, but at least that's my point of view. And that's, that's my last slide. So I, I mean, I hope I wasn't too long. <laughs> No, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pause recording. So thank you. And we'll move to, you know, if there's any other closing discussion remarks, then um, we'll save time for that.